be here today. Over the weekend, uh, I visited the Guyanese community in Suriname. I was accompanied by Member of Parliament and in Landela. We had the opportunity to meet with hundreds of Guyanese who have been affected in one way or another by the tragedy that befell some of our people there in Suriname. And listening to them firsthand, listening to their concerns, the anguish, their pain, um, and their fears lead me to believe that we are not treating this issue as seriously as it should be treated. Whilst in Suriname, I did not want to be critical of our government, but I want to today share some perspectives on how I feel about this matter. If they had only gone in the way that we did and met with the Guyanese on the ground, not in a closed door session at the embassy, then they would have realized how serious this matter is. And we would not have routine statements coming from the government in addressing this matter. So first of all, I wish to once again express what we have done in the past, that is through a party press statement, our sympathies with all of the families, the relatives, the people who have been affected, who have been killed at sea. And I want to say to them that the party shares their concern. All of Guyana, in fact, share their concern. Their, this issue will affect not just those who have been killed so brutally in an act of terrorism. I can't find other words to describe this, but an act of terrorism, given that from what we heard, that the, the purpose of the hijacking was not to steal. The relative said to me and others that this, the seine remained in the boats, the fish remained in the boats, the engine remained on the, on the boats. They never took any of the things that they will take in a routine hijacking. The purpose of going out there seem to be a sole one, that is to kill people. They told about individuals, one of the persons on the boat who escaped, recounted his ordeal and the, how, how the hijackers chop people about their body and they pour burning oil on them. And then at the end of this, while they were still alive, at the end of it, tied their batteries to their feet and some, threw some of them overboard. All along terrorizing them, saying we are here to, to kill you. And he, he managed to, to escape. And um, so, so there are numerous stories if you listen to some of the tapes of people talking who, who have either had direct relationship to this incident or who, are, who know what's going on at sea. Now, last week, Thursday, the president described this as a massacre. 
massacre of Guyanese abroad. And I would have expected that once the president described this as a massacre, then the entire government will treat this issue as a priority. The security forces, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and all the agencies associated with protecting Guyanese here at home and abroad. But we saw the government continuing to operate in the routine manner. The president said they've been successful. He saw, used the occasion to score political points. He said we have been successful at curbing piracy over the past three years. And if the president only were, had visited the community there in Suriname, in just one of the meetings, three boat owners got up and said, in just, when I total the number of times they have been hijacked in the last two years, it's nine times. Nine times, just three boat owners. One lady told me about the 24th of December. That is 2017. The issue is that a lot of the Ghanese who were fishing in Suriname's water historically, they could not get permits to work in Suriname. And so many of them migrated. And so most of the fishing in Suriname now is done by Guyanese. So it's not that they're not being hijacked, but because they're not fishing mainly in our waters, we don't know of the hijacking. But they're being hijacked in Suriname's waters routinely. And they believe by Guyanese. And you can just listen to the tapes of the people who stood up. They were not afraid and spoke about how many times they were hijacked. So the president is hopelessly out of touch with the issue. He thinks that because it's not happening in Guyanese waters, it's not happening at all. But it's happening in Suriname's waters affecting Guyanese because 95% of the fishing in Suriname is done by Guyanese. By Guyanese. Boat owners as well as <clears throat> workers and processors of fish. And so we, we decided to go to Suriname on Friday night. And so Saturday morning, I booked the ticket. And then, to my surprise, Saturday night, the minister flew out. And I knew he had an engagement on Monday morning here. But he hurriedly flew out and then met with some of the relatives in the embassy, and then had a meeting, I gather, with the Surinamese authorities. And we are glad that he did go to Suriname. But listen to, this, in the Starbuck News yesterday, no, Monday, they had a report on what the minister said. And he said, we told them we are here. This is telling the relatives. We told them we are here to tell Suriname's authorities that we want to collaborate and cooperate with them to the fullest. Imagine almost eight or nine days after the massacre described by our president as a massacre of Guyanese. You are now there to, in Suriname. You were telling people last Sunday that the reason for your visit is to tell the Surinamese authorities you'll cooperate with them to the fullest. You could have picked up a phone the next day. That is why you could go on the internet. If this doesn't represent negligence and lack of care, nothing does. You have to wait eight days to just go to Suriname to tell the Surinamese authority that you want to cooperate with them fully? 
It's unbelievable. It shows how they, they have treated this matter. And it's only now that we are bringing more attention to it and the media has been involved. We have not gotten any briefing from our government. Had it not been for the media, both here in Suriname, we have known very, very little. Last week, I met with the relatives um, home, at home. And many of them told us about attempts to talk to our own government and being rebuffed by it because, based on lack of knowledge of what was going on. It meant they did not contact their counterparts in Suriname. And therefore, a lot of what the minister praised the Surinamese authorities for did not, actu did not take place, nor were they funded like the search and rescue by helicopters. It was individuals who paid the gasoline, the, well not gasoline, but the, the fuel for those helicopters to fly and do the search and rescue, well, so, so, to search for the bodies. And so, because they did not do that, and, and I saw the police said, it was on Saturday or something like that, that they facilitated the documentation for seven persons to travel. And they did that because when we were at home by me, people said we want to go to Serena to be there to look for our relatives, uh, but they didn't have their, their travel documents updated. And it was MP Nigel Darmla who was there with me, who got in touch with Felix, and then Felix said, let them go and we will um, try to accelerate it. So even that effort that the police put out as helping people had to be initi initiated by, by us. So I, I made it clear that we did not want to treat this as a political matter. This is a tragedy. Our people are suffering. It's going to affect large numbers of people hundreds if not thousands of Ghanaians who live there, they're now stranded. They can't go to sea because of fear. They don't have income. These are Ghanaians who live in every part of Ghana. I met people from Linden, from East Bank, East Coast, um, Burbies, from even as far as Esikibo. Fishing, living in Suriname, earning money there. Some of them send back money to their relatives. Some travel back and forth all the time. They're stranded. They tell me they're running out of money. They can't go to sea. They can't earn. The families are dependent on them. So it will affect the economy of Suriname, but it will affect us too. That's from an economic perspective, but, but this is a tragedy. So we, we, um, we said we are hoping that our presence in Suriname would not only lend solidarity to the people there, to talk to them that they know that in Guyana our people have not abandoned them, that Guyanese are, all Guyanese are concerned about what happened to our people there. And secondly, that we wanted our presence there, and I'm, I do hope that this will help to raise the level of awareness in our government and to push them to act in a manner befitting of the horrific nature of this crime, that it is an exceptional crime, an act of terrorism against Ghanaians, and then it calls for exceptional measures in addressing this, not routine um, way of approaching it. Um, so we intend to raise this matter in Parliament on Friday. But the reason I have been speaking about it, although we are going to raise it in Parliament, is that I don't want to win mileage in Parliament for, on this issue. We're not carrying crows like some people are who pick on people's tragedy. I'm raising them 
because I want the minister to know what will be in our motion long ahead of before we raise it in Parliament and it's debated. So you'd have cha a chance to come prepared to address, in these, to address these issues. So we want to know what is being done on both sides, the measure of collaboration between Suriname and Guyana on this issue. Not just to the backslapping or coming to say we cooperating fully. We want to be assured that the security forces of the two countries are collaborating at the highest levels to ensure that we catch these perpetrators. We want assurances from the minister. Secondly, we want to know what is being done collaboratively to ensure the safety of people at sea. Because unless they feel safe, they will not be able to go out back to sea to continue to earn their livelihoods. And this will affect thousands of Guyanese. We wish to find out that from the minister about what level of assistance he's prepared to give. On Monday, he said, when asked by the same, I, I noticed in the Starbuck News, <coughs> when, when asked whether he, they would assist in bringing the bodies back, he said no, financially. Then on Tuesday, um, he apparently changed that to saying, yes, they will help financially because we've been calling on them since Sunday to assist financially. So he would tell us about that. We would like <coughs> to, um, to find out what he is doing with the Surinamese authorities to bring the concerns of the numerous Guyanese who were there, who were open at the, openly saying at the meetings that when they go to the police, there have been several instances when they have gone to police to report cases of hijacking, not this one, but the others that took place, some of those that took place in the past, no attention is being paid to them. And that because they're Guyanese, it seems as though the Surinamese police at the, some of the police stations don't heed their concerns. So raising this as an issue with the Surinamese authorities. Our people there, the majority of them are law-abiding citizens. They're there legally. They pay taxes. And they should expect fair representation from the, the, the authorities there too. Um, we expect, uh, we would like to know what the embassy is doing, what is its remit, how far it goes to protect the Guyanese interests abroad, and what help they can give to, to people there. One young lady was inconsolable. She traveled to Suriname since last Tuesday. They found her husband's body, um, but they would not allow her to go to the morgue. She said to me she has no income at home. Um, maybe I can even give you, I gave them my numbers, but we have their numbers, you can talk to them too. She has no income at home, two kids, they live in Kanji, and she can't stay on because it's expensive to, to stay there. And all she wants to do is to be able to go to the morgue to see if that person is her husband or not to identify the body. Now, I don't know what state the body is in, but whether she'll be able to identify it or they have to do the DNA. But what's wrong with our embassy saying to the Surinamese authority that she should could get to visit the morgue, supervise, and just look at the body? So she is like in a, a terrible state, can't visit it to conform. I think she wants closure. She wants to know. If, it, if she visits and she can't, she, can, she cannot um, de 
identify the body, then fine, by all means, a DNA test would be available. But these sorts of things. Then we'd like to find out about how the government, because people are prepared to speak about information they know. Some of them are even called names at the meeting. And, but a lot of people are fearful and this is a historic thing. This didn't just start with three years ago because I know of the situation when one time we recovered 40 engines from some people and we couldn't make cases because people were afraid to come forward with the information. So what <coughs> arrangements can we put in place being helpful too? I said to them, if you have information, come to Freedom House and, and you're worried about um, you know, people knowing or the police getting the information and releasing your name here in Guyana and you'd be probably harmed, come to Freedom House or the leader of the opposition office. If I get the information, I will share it with the police so you don't have to expose yourselves. But what, we, what can we do across the country, government, opposition, everyone collaborating together to make sure that when information comes in, it's treated confidential, confidentially, and people are not at risk for supplying information. And then I've asked um, Mr. Nandalal to look at, I suggested this at a meeting, and I've asked him to look at the possibility of using our terrorism laws to go after some of these, well, the, the people who perpetrated this horrific act. Because under any qualification, this will be, or under any criterion, this must qualify as an act of terrorism. And so my, the people were worried that if we apprehend people over here, but the jurisdictional claim is made that the crime did not, was not committed in Guyanese territory, then we may not be able to hold them for very long. But if we use the Terrorism Act, I believe that we will have jurisdiction. The United States of America, if you commit an act of terrorism against any American or anyone else in any part of the world, they hold you responsible. And we too must use the tools that we have to protect our people, whether they are at home or abroad, from, from criminals of this nature. So this is not a routine traffic accident and where a person lost his or her life, and that is bad in itself, much less something of this nature, where so many of our people have been killed in a brutal manner, and all we have are statements from the president of this nature, massacre, and we see this lackadaisical approach by his government to addressing it. And we hope that by pushing a bit more, that the, gov the government of Ghana will pay serious attention to this man. Okay. The second issue I want to address is what took place in court um, today. Um, yes. Okay. Where where um, we have witnessed this a circus. Now, this what happened here might be shocking to Guyana that to people who expected decency from the government, in spite of all they have been seeing and hearing about this government, they still expected some modicum of decency to, to be there within the government. But for us who have been in the political arena, 
what played out in Parliament yesterday is not shocking, it's not a revelation. It was expected. APNU is operating according to plan. So, in the pre-election period, Granger and many others declared their intention and led by the Kaichur News too, that we must jail Brassington, Ashni Singh, Jagdeer, a whole list of people for acts of corruption that they must be jailed. They declare this across the country on their platforms. Almost every speaker routinely got up and spoke about jailing them. The government, as soon as it got into office, embarked on a process that they believe would result in this outcome. The process involved these audits, the so-called forensic audits, or which are not forensic audits by any standards, but forensic audits. And what happened? We had 50 of them. The government is realizing increasingly by the day, and they've admitted this, some of them, some who are in the coalition now who have called me and said we're not party to this. We from the coalition government that we don't agree with this approach. But who have openly said they don't have evidence of the corruption, then the, the audits did not generate the evidence that they thought was there. So they made a promise already to their supporters. In the face of APNU losing ground on everything else, people losing jobs in spite of their promises, they are, are married in a whole pile of corruption scandals, a ton of corruption scandals they are all engaged in. They have not delivered on any of their promises to the public servants to the teachers, to, the, to the, the rice farmers, the sugar workers, not to the old people, not to young people, nothing else. In the face of this, they have to pursue this allegation at all costs, this, this outcome that they promised. And so what has happened? Ashni Singh and Brassington have been charged not for finding a single cent in their account that they didn't earn, not for finding a hundred dollars in their account that they didn't earn, or much less the millions that they thought that they said they stole. Not for that, but for claiming that they didn't, they had misconduct in public office because they did not do a valuation of some properties that they sold even after public tender, which establishes the market value. And I explained at a previous press conference that if you apply those standards to the past and now, under the afternoon, they sold GTNT with no valuation, almost 20 entities were sold without any public tender or any valuation of assets but under the PNC in the past. And if you look at what's happening now, routinely that's happening again. So it must have a lot of the people who are looking at this, the public officers, will be very worried. But coming back to the main point, they were not charged for stealing now, but for that issue that the cabinet of Guyana, the cabinet of Guyana decided to pursue. 
So privatization unit made the recommendation to a privatization board. It then went to the cabinet, the 20 odd members of cabinet looked at the recommendation and they said, fine, a cabinet dis decision was issued. It went back to the Ministry of Finance for implementation. They implemented it and the privatization unit. That is what they're being charged for. But they had to make it a media circus. And I recognize this because, what is it? Reputational damage. So, some, some of the newspapers may be orgasmic today, like Kaicho News, because this is what they always wanted. They, and so they show Ashni Singh and Brassington going to court now in, in handcuffs. And that made their day. But what is at stake here? If they can do it to individuals who serve this country at the highest level and followed instructions from the cabinet, they put at risk not only every single public servant for future action, but even cabinet members themselves. And trust me, these we have on almost every single cabinet member here, much significant acts where capris and decisions were made in their ministries that cost the treasury lots of money without even being endorsed by the cabinet and were in clear flagrant viola violation of our procurement laws. So let me make it clear again. The PPP's position is to the public servants in this country. Make records. They, you have nothing to fear from a PVP government once you act above the board. But I'm going to warn those who have been so vindictive <clears throat> in pursuing some of these unsubstantiated charges just to destroy people's reputation that they have a lot to worry about. That is why I said the nature of the charge is frivolous. And we have, they have now, so it is a signal to all of Guyana. I, I'm, I'm thinking about a businessman who might want to, um, who might want to, to invest in this country. Looking at what's going on today, they must be thinking, if a government could be so vindictive and subvert agencies, give political directions to SOKU, and bully <coughs> the DPP in withdrawing charges that were laid against them for real corruption by claiming she was protecting good governance, then what sort of protection would they have for their, themselves and their business? This must be an act. This will be an act that will drive fear not just in pull where anybody, public servants, but in the business class of this country. And they have to be justified about that fear because this government can intervene anywhere to get you placed before the court on frivolous charges, even subverting agencies that are there constitutionally to protect, protect you. And so it is according to plan. This is all according to plan. This was never about corruption, never about fighting corruption. This is about damaging reputations to say to their supporters or some of their supporters, look, we are fulfilling what we promised. And so whether you have evidence or not, let's pursue it. Now let's talk about the evidence. So on another set of charges that some of our members of parliament that were instituted against some of our members of parliament on the GRDB matter. Six times or so, the magistrate has directed the prosecutor to make to the defense, make available to the defense, the audit report on which they base the charges. 
six times. And Soku has refused to present that report in spite of the instructions of the magistrate. How can you prepare a defense if you can't even see the charges, the, the, the source document on which the charges were based? This tells you one thing, that they're worried that the audit report on which they base the charges will not, will exonerate, will not support the laying of those charges. So now the lawyers have to now go on behalf of these two MPs to an upper court to have the matter struck off. And so yesterday in the Kaicho News itself, it after Anil Nandilal asked that the Administration of Justice Act be used in this instance so that people could be then tried summarily. This is what the prosecutor said. Lake stated that he was not ready to disclose statements in the matter and by applying the AGAA, he would be compelled to do so. Imagine you go to the court, you charge Ashney Singh and Brassington for misconduct in public office, and then you tell when the lawyer for the defense says we'd like to you be the people to be tried summarily, so they can, you say to the magistrate, we can't, we are opposed to this because we don't want that act because we'd be forced to disclose statements made to us. How are they going to prepare their defense if they don't even get the statements? This is a normal thing in law. This reveals not just how frivolous the charges are, but how on, on the shaky grounds that they're on, that they don't even want to pre present the defense with material that they are using to charge them on. How are they going to respond? And in the case of Goldsman's report audit, I saw Starbuck News had some elements of it, but you should, I would hope that today, the Starbuck News would look at the 200 pages of response to every item raised in the audit by Goldsman that was addressed comprehensively by the privatization unit when the audit was being done. The management letter went to them. And then you will see how shoddy and political a person like Goldsoran was. His work was any, any accountant, if they present that to any accounting agency, regulatory body, they'll probably take away his, his license for shoddy work based on the responses. You please look at that, because in many cases, they did not share, which is a normal thing in an audit. If you do an audit, you, you confront the, the people being audited and say, here are our findings. What are your explanations for those before I finalize my report? In most of the audits, they finalize the report without giving the agencies a chance to respond. In this case, they did, and the agency responded, responded. And so you will see how shoddy the audits are. So this was always designed to be a circus. These people, to put them on six million bail is a travesty each. They were abroad. They came back home voluntarily. They came back home voluntarily to attend court. And then to put them on that charge is basically all or the, or the bail. It fits in all with a, a plan. The prosecutor argued that they are people of means. I don't know if he looked into their account. They are people of means. So charge them as though that is uh, a reason 
for granting bail or not granting bail. Once you grant bail, then you have an expectation that people are not a flight risk. But we have seen this before. You may recall in the private matter that, that Christopher Ram filed against me, the magistrate even not prevented me from traveling. On a private matter, she ordered that I don't travel. Of course, the High Court threw it out. But we've seen this sort of thing when there are political cases. And so, I, if this, would, this is a sad day for Guyana. Had they charged Ashni Singh or Brassington that they discovered an account with a million dollars or 50,000 Guyana dollars or something else, that would have been very different. Here, they have no evidence of any corruption. Absolutely none. It's a fishing expedition. It's designed to support a political purpose. And it's a sad day for Ghana. But we expect more of this. This will happen with increasing frequency. I've said this to all of our MPs, that long before the elections are held, they will do this to a number of other people because they're interested in destroying reputations. And, and they're hoping maybe they can influence somebody to get convictions so that some of our people can't you know, be part of the list, etc. This is what they're hoping. It's typical APNU behavior, typical PNC behavior. So this is playing out according to their plan. On the, the corruption issues, the fuel boat was released quietly. Harman, up to now, Harman would not know. I guess he wouldn't know who owns the boat or the boat because he didn't, he didn't get the document from the registry by now. You know, after years and several times this boat being held, it should have been confiscated, charged, you know, lots of um, taxes charged here, triple the duty paid value of the product, people should have been by now charged, but again, you have a lot of big people in the government now running the fuel smuggling racket. It's huge, huge. Um, the government will no longer pursue the forensic audit of GRA because they don't have money. I thought that they would want to do that because the GRA is a major entity and um, they, will, they should want to find out if there was corruption in the GRA too, in our, our era. I see they're no longer pursuing that. Um, we have seen an attorney general who is a I don't understand. I can't, I don't want to describe him the way the thoughts are going through. I don't want to verbalize the thoughts that are going through my head now. But imagine this guy puts out an ad three years after they're, they're in office. Now he wants to know who has, um, who's been doing representations on behalf of the chambers. In the past, for cases in the past, and current cases. He doesn't know. He puts out an ad now. Why did he put this out three years ago? If anyone is worth the, his salt, or even has a, a, a tiny bit, a 1% level of competence, when you go to an, a desk, you, will Im you would say to your staff, can you find out for me all the cases we have outstanding so that this office, I could be apprised of the cases outstanding. You would say, were there people who were representing us outside of this chamber? You can meet Anil Nandalal in the parliament and ask him. Or you could ask your staff because they did have institutional memory there, in there. 
And these people appeared on our behalf in a public thing, not as in the chambers or in like, they appeared on our behalf in the era, the PPP era, not in like up in the mountains in Tiger Pond that we hid them away. Their, their, their representation of the government was recorded in the newspapers, etc. It's not, it's not hidden, locked away in some vault. I myself offered Granger, when I paid the courtesy call on him, to have them briefed about the cases. If you go back and read what I said in the period after I left Granger's office, just after they took power, to have him briefed on all the big matters that were, would have a ruling against us would cost the Treasury billions of dollars. I offered to do that. They ignored the offer. He didn't find out. And then he blames the PPP. Every time there is a ruling for, against him, he does. It, it's something like a Pontius Pilate thing. It's not us. It had to be the PPP. And, and as a, but it is not. I don't believe that he's unaware. I have information that he's had discussion with Tulsi Pasad on this matter before, after, the, after the, the government changed. So he was not unaware of the matter that led to the, the award of um, a, a huge award against the state on that matter. He couldn't be unaware of the Haig-Bosch matter. That's been in the public domain. You had a lot of to and fro. But they opted to settle the matter. And I wonder if people are benefiting financially from all of these settlements by claiming lack of knowledge. I'm just saying I wonder. But I, would, I probably should say I'm confident, but I'm saying I wonder now <laughs> that it is a conduit. It is a conduit for corrupt activities, these big judgments. On the other hand, what they did, we didn't have the DDL matter. They chose to settle it. That was in the court. The appeal was current. He knew of it, but he took it out of court, we, and now opted to settle that matter, and that was has exposed the Treasury to a potential liability of about $80 billion. But nobody holds these people accountable for anything. I kept saying that by, by now, they would have settled, including that matter, cases that would potentially lead to about $80 billion of liability, $85 billion of liabilities to the Treasury, about $85 billion. Already we're paying some of them. I said that in the 23 years of the People's Progressive Party, if all the settlements amounted to $2 billion, it would be a lot. That's the magnitude. That's the difference. And in three years, this is what they did. They would, be, take no, uh, they would not claim it's corruption, incompetence. They would not say that you know, this is putting burden on the Treasury. This is more money that could have kept Gaisuko going and, and help the, the rice farmers and the bauxite workers and everyone else and the miners. But they don't have money for those things. So this is, there is a ton of corrupt practices going on right before our eyes. I saw the AFC sending out a note now to people. And by the way, you saw the, the AFC um, release, press release that they had. It, it, you know, I don't know which world these people live in. They, they, just, they said um, that people are significantly better off today than in the past. After losing, let them tell the, the 7,000 sugar workers and all the others who have lost their jobs that they are better off today than in the past. 
And then they went on to say Burby's development, that how satisfied the rice farmers are and the others and their support is growing because most notably street lights were installed on the quarantine highway. Is, is this, this is what we get from a party that still takes itself seriously when no one else does. And no, no one else takes them ser seriously. That, th to see something like that and piracy, how well they did and how it was rampant under the PPP government. They're looking to make, make uh, mileage from that without understanding how it has shifted and it's still, still going on. I, they're, I, don't want to, um, I don't want to talk much about this press release, but they're, they're, there is, they're rehiring their PR specialists. Some of them are from Jamaica and paying them through other, other contracts that are done through the Ministry of Public Works. Inflating the contracts and paying the PR consultants. And this is what is happening now. That's one thing that we will investigate, by the way, because we have reasonably good information about how the contracts have been inflated to help a particular individual who then selects people to come here. And so this is, this is the, the AFC. Um, I've noticed the president saying the ball is in my court on the the appointment, the substantive appointment of the Chancellor and the Chief Justice. And may I ask you to bring to his attention once again the letter that I sent to him on the 7th of February, 2018. It says, Your Excellency, appointment of Chancellor and Chief Justice in accordance. I'm reading it out for him, so just in case he didn't read it. In accordance with Article 121, uh, 127 one of the Constitution of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Pursuant to our meeting held on January 3rd, 2018, I've duly considered the two nominees for whom you seek my agreement for appointment as Chancellor of the Judiciary and Chief Justice, respectively, in accordance with Article 127 one of the Constitution of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. As promised, I have done the requisite due diligence. It is with deep regret that I inform you that I'm unable to offer my agreement to the appointment of Mr. Justice Kenneth Andrew Charles Benjamin as Chancellor of the Judiciary and Madam Justice Yonet Desina Cummings Edwards as Chief Justice. Please be informed that I remain cognizant of the fundamental importance of securing sub substantive appointments to these two high constitutional offices. As a result, I'm committed to continuous engagement with Your Excellency until there is due compliance with 27.1 of the Constitution. That's the letter I sent to him, which I committed myself to continuous engagement with him. He then went to the media and said, he will not allow one man to hold this up. And I had to subsequently point out that he himself, as opposition leader and president, held it up for nearly six, six years or so. And I had one month. And he said, I would, not allowing, I, I would not allow one man to do this, to hold up the appointments. I'm now seeking legal advice. He's not said, to the, he's not said a word to the country about what the legal advice recommended. He has not gotten back to me. And he now says, he woke up and says, because I think he forgot everything in between. I think he forgot everything in between, that the ball is in my court. I believe he th still thinks he's waiting on me for a reply. Um, this is serious. This is serious. So 
I just wanted to put my position out there um, that ball has always been in his court. Um, I haven't heard anything about the police service commission, you know, too, um, from the president. Maybe, maybe I just deal with one other issue and um, or two other issues and and then I will end. The Lindo Creek uh, matter, um, I don't think things are going well for the father of a cabinet member and the brother of a cabinet member who, now, who are the key players who are appointed by President Granger in the COI, the COI. That is retired Justice Patis, um, Trotman and the, the Henry, is the, um, the lawyer is to the commission is Henry. I can, from what I've been reading in the media, it seems as though they're not there to find out the truth. They act more as prosecutors. That when people present views that are contrary to their belief, that they they're in for an assault, and that they are the questions asked of them sound more like prosecutorial questions, not questions designed to elicit the truth, which is the purpose of a COI. So the commissioner has to ask questions that would elucidate things, that would make things clear, not prosecute the people, make them feel that they are lying. They are coming forward voluntarily, most of them. And the same thing from the from the lawyer to the commission. His job is to take people who come to the commission through in a comfortable way, to give as much evidence to the commission which will draw its conclusion. So, some people are encouraged when, if they give a narrative that is close to what I believe the government thinks, and if they give anything uh, um, contrary to that narrative, which is that the army, and the narrative is that the army massacred people at Lindo Creek. That is what this government is trying to prove, that our army massacred people, our people, which is patently false. That is what they're trying to prove. Didn't prove anything about fine man. This is about, imagine this is a COI to find out the truth about what took place in that period. Not the fine man massacre, not everything else, but trying to prove our army. And I'm sure our soldiers are taking note of this, what they're trying to do. But, but when the narrative, so I've been seeing some very interesting facts being revealed now, actual facts, not manufactured today, but statements that were taken at that time by people who were directly involved. And I, I told you, as president, I heard of it too, that the police had a statement from this young member who was there, but he was a minor. And I'm, I'm extremely pleased that they took the statement from him in the present, presence of pastors, two pastors who were there, that it was a caution statement and he, he, he pointed out what we knew, that it was fine man who massacred those people. But we're paying large sums of money, and we've yet to find out. We call on this president to do a COI that has a comprehensive, comprehensive terms of reference that starts off with the escape of these prisoners, the, what role that people played, political players played in helping them to settle in a community um, that, that they took over and terrorized, they, and then used that community as a base to terrorize others, but particularly the role of, of political players 
and then the subsequent massacres and the, and the cover-up. How they got weapons. We saw some of the GDF weapons. Now, that surface that they were using. But they also had weapons from the past that the Walter Rodney Commission of Inquiry pointed out, showed, that were given to the PNC over 100 weapons that resurfaced in the crime wave in 2002 from the 1970s. Those weapons that were handed over to PNC resurfaced there. I would like him to look at all of that. And then he could also look at the role that the drug dealers, you know, they like to talk about drug dealers and whether drug dealers had any link with the government too. That could be part of the terms of reference. So why not we are awaiting eh, this? But believe me, it's not going to happen because some of the players are huge in government now. Some of them who used to visit the others. They're, they're, the last matter I'll deal with is um, what I believe, it's an assault. I think the APNU is very worried that we in the PBP are made it clear that we're working hard to go back on the ground, resuscitate our base where we were weak. Uh, we are doing um, a lot of work on the ground, connecting back with people wherever our traditional support felt alienated, that we were encouraging them, and that we are doing a lot of work in the Amerindian communities, pointing out how everything has stalled. So not just the land titling. Two days ago, I saw a report that they're going to pursue the hinterland um, electrification, not electrification, ICT program, the ICT program. But that was, that it's funded from GRIF. It is an old program that we left, a 17 million US program. So now they're resuscitating it. We point this out to people and our support in the Amerindian um, communities, it's maintained been strong and it's growing because people see the true nature of this government. I was in Region 9 and people said to me, Granger himself came and made promises to us. They have not fulfilled any of those promises when he was opposition leader. So that, and then I said, and I'm saying it once again, openly that the PPP is underrepresented in membership among afro Ghanaians, and that it is our job and, uh, as a party and as general secretary to make sure that we work harder in afro Ghanaian communities to get more members to join, people to join the PVP to broaden our base, to, re to reflect Guyana ideally. Although I pointed out that in government, we had a broad-based government. When you look at it, it's diversity along religious, ethnic, gender line. It was broad based. So this must be hurting, hurting the PNC because we talk about it openly. We don't go to bottom houses. We don't go through whisper campaigns. And they know that what they are doing now is destroying some afro Guyanese employment opportunities too. Thousands of afro Guyanese suffer just like who, who supported PNCs, just like everyone else. So they, they got their accord there. Every time they're dumb, they bring out, they must have meetings with people like David Hines and the others. So let me give you, David Hines said, I never, never really spoke out against him being terminated at Chronicle. And there was a reason for that. So I saw some of our colleagues writing, expressing solidarity. But let me tell you, the reason I did not take a public position on the matter. From the beginning, I, I saw it for what it was. The Chronicle readership is practically limited to government officials and a tiny group. 
Chronicle does not have circulation. The, this, I believe that they had, the Chronicle, the government had some engagement with the Kaichor News because the Kaichor News, um, you know, got their ra radio license now and they feel this deep sense of gratitude to the government situation where they were fired from Chronicle, became heroes of fighting against this government, so they gain a little bit more credibility. They are heroes because they are balanced and they fight against this government, which is all nonsense to me. It's not, they don't really fight against this government. They just all the time excuse them. And guess what? According to plan, they have landed themselves some prime position in the Kaicho News now, which has a bigger readership, to get their jaundiced views against the PPP out. So I think this is all a plot. It's a storm in a teacup designed to make these people bigger than who they are. Now, they, David Hines talks about representing afro guyanese and what we have done and then i'll go through a couple of quotes but i don't see him now fighting on behalf of the 51 families that got their land 41 families taken away who were all black i didn't see him go out and speak out when the vendors were her i don't see him going to linden and talking to the people there who have major problems or those in Aichuni and Kwakwani who can't sell their logs. His support for afro guyanese is he now, he gets a cushy, he and his family, they have cushy jobs with this government or scholarship. And they're all beneficial. All these afro guyanese um, acti the activists who say they represent afro guyanese rights. When are they ever on the ground dealing with the concerns of ordinary people? Never. In fact, they try to excuse this government harming the livelihood of, the, of those people. So I have gone, I've sat down with people in Victory Valley in Linden and talked to the Rasta and the other communities and we built a bridge together. When has he ever done something of that nature? Or as president, go to meet people in the middle of protests in Linden and talk to them about their concerns. We built, put secure their power, we built a new hospital. I, as president, walked the, in places like Victory Valley, not Victory Valley, Block 22, and, and Amelia's Ward, when it was bare, worked out, mined out bauxite areas without houses there, and we built houses in those areas. And I can trace hundreds of other things done. There are about 400 of the 1,000 kids that went abroad to study medicine that are of afro guyanese descent. I can go down a long list. When I had a choice to choose the, who the head of the army was, every instance I chose a person who has been there of afro guyanese descent and, and in the police force, the head of the central bank, the head of the stats bureau. That's real issues. I, can, I don't want to do that because we can do that. afro guyanese grew economically under us. So when he, when he says, during the PPP rule, it never implemented one policy that was aimed at uplifting african guyanese not one. This is David Hines, not one, he said. But you check, compare the two periods on the PNC and this period, and, and our period in office, and now again, and in every single count, you will see on land ownership, or on, on business ownership, on employment opportunities, you will see afro guyanese fared better under the PVP than any other government since since independence and so 
I can go on to talk about it. Um, he said the, the PPP, because of the Indian Guyanese majority, could maintain the facade of a democratically elected government. But in the Guyanese, if you look at the census, there's about 40% of the population, just over 40% of the population. We have worked everywhere to get votes. In, in 2006, 23% of Region 10 voted PPP. Clearly, he is. And the belief that the PPP has a God-given right to govern Guyana. There's only one party that believes that. That's PNC. And he works for them now, this new government. That's why they steal elections. There's no God-given right. You have to work for it. That's why we emphasize democracy and freedom. So people can choose whoever they want. In the last elections, we're, we're here now. And, but every election was certified free and fair. And then he says, they paid lip service to egalitarianism, but they were deeply in love with a narrow definition of democracy, inherent in aspects in communism. In other words, they loved the dictatorship more than the proletariat in the slogan, dictatorship of the proletariat, that they abandoned any pretense of being a socialist government when they returned to power in 1992 was inevitable. Socialist rhetoric was a means to an end, domination. That we were dictators. This all sounds, um, he says we have a fidelity to the ideology of ethnic domination. If anyone has, it's people like David Hines and, and I saw they got the other one too, um, what's his name, Lincoln Lewis, to chip in. You know that Jack Deere is close to the Russians. That's why um, the investments came here. But he, he would never forgive me for when the workers at Burn Mine chased him out and said they don't want to deal with him, that they prefer to deal with me when I visited them. I chased him away. They didn't want to deal with him because he has a, a way of selling out workers. Being a, always more involved with the company and so he would never forgive. But this is the sort of thing that people like David Himes and the others, they all benefit. Why do you think that it's just rhetoric about how they hate the government? But he gets, he gets his bread from them now. And his family gets benefits from them. <coughs> and this, this is it. I, they're more dangerous to ethnic harmony in Guyana. Um, than anything else. And that's why I call them fossils. They live in a different time. They believe they can continue to, to, to direct our people so that they make decisions based on how they look, not policies. And we must fight them constantly. So he is now in a be better place to carry the line of the government. And he has a broader reach to Kaichor. And don't, nobody should ever tell me, because I never believe it, that it, their firing was not contrived. It not, has nothing to do with press freedom. Because being there, uh, in fact, they would have embraced them. They were apologists for the government all along. Don't see why they should fire them. Thank you. Question on the issue of the appointment of a uh, substitute chancellor of chief justice. The president keeps on saying that the ball is in your court. You said today that the ball is in the president's court. Where do we go from here? Uh, the back and forth will continue, obviously. Yeah. Well, well, from your point of view, do you agree? With he Trump? is the president of Guyana. Hmm. He has a, to initiate, I have already given my position. I said, I'm prepared to engage you further. He needs to get back to me about the mode of that engagement. Right. That is my position. So you don't, you, don't, you don't plan to approach the president again this time? No, 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 because I don't understand. I made it clear. I read my letter. Right. And so it's a, he should be saying, OK, I read your letter. Let's, let's find a way to move forward, having expressed that willingness.
I'd save that on my, my total um, view because I noticed the reporters already uh, looking like they have other things to do. So, so let me save my views on the economy for the next press conference, or I could do it just, uh, uh, maybe in a sit-down interview. But, um, but it is sad. You're absolutely right that we are we deteriorating rapidly, and there's been no specific measure or no leadership to arrest this decline. What we hear are platitudes about so, some new conference, new set of people coming around, etc. But the outlook is even worse. So what we see now is not the bottom of the tank. It, it has a far way to go if they don't take remedial measures. And this government is notorious because of their obsession with taxes and their philosophy that the state needs to control everything is just implementing a pro-cyclical policy that will drive the economy further into the drain. And all of these, all of these distractions about Ashni Singh, et cetera, just harms the, the investment climate more. Because people don't want, they want your courts to be predictable, they want justice there. They don't want the government to be vindictive and harass you because of perceived politics. So I'll leave that for another day. <coughs> Sure. Um, one. So let me start with that one. We filed a case on the Hague Bosch. Okay. Um, I, no, I, I don't think we, we went to that one as yet. The Hague, Hague Bosch. No, um, I, I'm jumping the gun. I'm jumping, I, ju I just jumped the gun because I don't want to. There is a specific um, case we're preparing. And um, I might have just spoken out of it. That would, could detail some of the way the settlement was made. You see, if we argue that any government has to defend the interests of the state, and so what this government is doing, like, like when the green mining construction came, um, they filed for arbitration after we got into office. Well, it, the matter was there before we got into office. But because of what PNC had done in the bauxite industry, they didn't pay them their money, and they had a stripping contract, I think. So we went, we defended that case. Although we may not have agreed with it, but the state would have faced liabilities. What did we do? We asked Carl Greenwich as a former Minister of Finance to come and be an um, give evidence on behalf of the government of Guyana. That's how we approached it, in because we saw the interests of the state being at stake. So I'll just give you one example of how we approached it. In this contrast that with this here, this Attorney General is claiming that they don't know, but the settlements, I believe, are done in some cases where even there is a great chance of succeeding. You don't have to go through a settlement. For example, the DDL matter. Now, you don't have to do that because you have a great chance of succeeding in, in this issue. So why would you want to settle 
an issue and put the state at risk for $80 billion of liability when you can pursue it to the end? What's driving the settlement? And so far, not a single media house has been able to get from the government of Guyana who authorized the settlement. Was it the Commissioner General? Was it the Board of GRA? Was it the Minister of Finance? Or, the, or was it the Cabinet? You know, those, if you can get those answers in each one of them, if it was not done by the head of the GRA, it would be illegal because they have no jurisdiction under the Act. And so we are, we'll get more details. You'll get more details as time, time goes on. But with this government, like that would give us a great idea. I'm sure that, that if you read the bank's DIH case that they filed, they're asking some questions too. Why not take those questions and go to the Minister of Finance and ask him who, who, who exposed the government to $80 billion of liabilities? With Exxon Mobil, I have made several statements. I've said that we are unhappy with the approach of this government to the whole issue of the oil and gas sector. I pointed out that one, when we call for transparency in the sector, they made a ton of excuses some carried prominently in the other new, the newspapers that are pursuing now this, this contract with ExxonMobil, saying that we, we put in the law provisions for non-disclosure. They made false statements again that we, we had given out all the blocks. We pointed that out to be untrue. We, we have pointed out that no work has been done, substantive work has been done on the framework for a predictable oil sector that would, inform, that would include, although they made a promise to do that, that would include an independent petroleum commission, a, a sovereign wealth fund, auctioning of future blocks, and, and um, they then also def a definition of what local content legislation, uh, uh, a local content legislation, so that all the issues like we saw today about the brokerage service in, in given to a Trinidad company, those issues would have been resolved in the context of strong local content legislation. They have not done that. And then what tax measures are going to be, or the package of incentives that anyone who invests in the oil sector will get and what they will not get. We need clarity on those. So those are in a generic sense, and there has been no movement on this. But if we had movement on the generic issues, we can then say, here is it that you're operating outside of the framework established. The frame, establishing the framework itself would have given great confidence. Then on the Exxon Mobil contract specifically, I said we are unhappy with the approach that they took to signing it, that it was not, they needed to get the best technical people in the room and advice from the best technical people. It seems as though they don't take advice from their own advisors, that we would have liked a negotiating brief to be made either to the president, the cabinet should have approved the negotiating brief or made available to the parliament, and then they should have entered the negotiations. We said that there are provisions in the, in the um, agreement that we are very unhappy with, very unhappy with, because they are a big departure from the 1999 agreement signed by Janet Jagan with the group that comprised ExxonMobil. So we said that too. So as a political party, we have made it clear we are unhappy with the process. We are unhappy with the contract itself that was signed. Very unhappy. 
But I also have to make sure that I don't, as a leader of the opposition and head of a political party, that I don't get accused of, uh, uh, of contributing to a climate where we re repudiate contracts once a legitimate government has signed them. So I said there are two approaches to this matter. You repudiate the contract, and then you're in a contentious fight with ExxonMobil. We are more in favor of our government agreeing at the cabinet to approach ExxonMobil for a renegotiation. We're, and we will support that. But we have made it clear that ExxonMobil came out of this renegotiation way ahead by billions of dollars ahead of Guyana on this. I, you, so th th those are the things I've, I've spoken about. So what's next? So we, that is why we have to put pressure on our government to approach the company. But they, are, they have made it clear already that they don't want to do this. And you know, they don't want to do this. They don't even want to try. They don't even want to try in spite of the fact that they are saying now, yes, there may be something, you know, making excuses for it, but in the future we'll correct it. And not even saying what they will correct. If they could even answer to the Kaichor News or anyone else, because Kaichor News has been at this for a while. If they can answer to you what they're going to change from the ExxonMobil in future contracts, because they're busy signing up things. So what are they precisely? Are they going to put back stability clause? Are they going to put back this the thing about gas, gas fund, and give limit? You know my big, big concern is limiting the amount of gas that could come on shore only to satisfy domestic demand. The, that is huge if we find a big gas field out there. We didn't need to do that. So I have great concerns about this contract. And I've expressed those from the very beginning, the day that it, it was renegotiated. But also, I have a duty to make sure we're part, we're, we're in the opposition. We're a big party that would likely be the next government. And, and that's why we have to to be careful. Thank you.